Dobro jutro. Good morning. Uh, thank you for uh, coming at the Skopje Forum on the future of liberal democracy in Europe and, uh, and the Balkans, which is an uh, ambitious uh, undertaking, but also a timely undertaking for CRPM uh, for two or more reasons. One is definitely their 10th te anniversary. And when you come from uh, uh, this region, 10 years is actually quite a lot. And uh, when you're a think tank, and when you come and when you try to do an independent uh, work outside of the government structures uh, and outside of uh, uh, direct political meddling, 10 years seem almost like a century. Uh, so it is indeed a, a great achievement. The second thing why this is a, a timely and ambitious undertaking is that when you're in a periphery, as Skopje inevitably is, both geographically, politically and economically, um, it's very healthy from time to time to look at what's happening into the center. Of course, we follow what's happening in the center. We get the waves, we get the ripples. Uh, we are not exempt of the general trends. Um, but um, I believe that the ambition of this conference is uh, actually to have the discussion here rather than us, as usually, being a listeners of a discussion elsewhere in Europe and then trying to shout back uh, and maybe and hope that our uh, voice will be, uh, will be heard. Uh, in the first panel, uh, you see that we will try to sort of abstract ourselves or at least uh, not discuss right away the Balkans and Macedonian, uh, Macedonian settings. Uh, and, uh, I, I hope that we will be able to cover uh, quite a uh, large uh, territory. I have four distinguished uh, contributors to this discussion. I invite you to take the, the program and their bios and uh, history and very notable achievements, which will probably will take me half an hour if I start now uh, introducing everyone, are, are listed in the, in the um, in the brochures. I would rather like to plunge directly into the discussion. The organizers gave us this uh, uh, quite broad uh, title on the future of Europe, democracy, uh, and the European Union itself. Um, and they also tried to gather several different perspectives. Unlike other places, it seems that time um, is at greater disposal here in Skopje, and I'm really great. We have almost two and a half hours, which is a generous timing for a panel. Uh, and I, I thought to use the, the best of, of four speakers, but also not to deprive you from uh, basic human rights, uh, including smoking rights. So we will do um, a, a small five minute break uh, in these two and a half hours. Uh, and for those who are not smoking, feel free to stretch out, do yoga, or whatever it pleases you. That will bring you back uh, more refreshed. Uh, and uh, with more blood in, in your brain to be able to listen to our, our contributions. Uh, what I will, would like to <coughs> proceed is uh, basically to invite uh, in the left corner here uh, uh, to start off with a general reflection of where Europe is. Uh, recently we had the uh, European parliamentary elections uh, and uh, as well uh, Europe is grappling with the aftermath of the economic crisis. So a short reflection, uh, and I ask uh, Dusan and, and, and Vladimir to uh, present uh, sort of an opening statement, one from the political side, the other one more from the economic side. And then um, uh, we will have uh, Hans and Piotr refer, uh, reflecting their short comments, and I will open the, the floor for your uh, comments, questions, and, and, and discussions. After the small, small uh, uh, short smoking break, I would like to introduce the bear in our debate, uh, most notably Russia, uh, and I would like to uh, sort of introduce more the geopolitical consequences of the, of the latest debate. Uh, we have uh, here also representative of the Europe at large, which is the Council of Europe, the, the greater Europe that actually encompasses those uh, organizations, and in Hans Jürgen we have someone who follows the foreign policy, and then we'll talk more about the, the geopolitics, foreign policy, Europe at large, 
and eventually, of course, uh, we will come back to the Balkans and see where Balkans fits into that general debate. So that's the sort of the layout, ambitious layout for the for the next uh, the next session. And uh, I would count on you being as well um, not only active listeners but uh, uh, active participants in, in asking questions uh, and making short uh, arguments if you if you please. So without further ado, I will pass the floor to uh, to Dushan to basically provide an opening statement, his own reflections on what he saw with the recent developments on the political side in the European Union. Thanks, Gordon. He says to the left, and Gordon, the left, a right a relative to us, and from your point of view, obviously we are the right wing. So, uh, a little bit of what I'm going to say will be a sort of hybrid between left and right, and, point, and we'll point out to the relativity of political analysis. Of course, talking about the future is impossible because we are not equipped with a crystal ball to look into it. So basically, when we're discussing future developments, we are looking at the past. And we're also looking at current trends and then we're trying to see what's plausible or not. So I'll start with a very historic approach. I'll try to remind us all what the EU essentially, the narrative of the EU is about. And it's about two promises that are connected to the EU. One is, the first promise is that the EU is about creating a better life for everyone. And the second promise is that the EU is about creating, if you want, Kant's eternal peace on the continent. So, let's look into the state of the first promise, and this is to create eternal peace after the Second World War when the EU was created. The point was to interlock the national economies of the countries so strongly, especially to get the German national economies so much connected to the rest of Europe, that war would not be possible again, that just for economic reasons it would not function any longer. And each next step of enlarging the European Union had this in the back, had this idea that uh, taking new countries into the EU will eliminate the risks of war when Spain, Portugal and Greece were taken into the European Union. This was in order to avoid the authoritarian threat. These countries had just come out of, of, of a very dark period under fascist rule. So get them in. The same story was when, when the communism collapsed, etc. in Eastern Europe. Get those countries as fast as possible into the European Union to increase stability and security in the region. But nowadays, this narrative of more peaceful enlargement, I think, has come to a standstill because, frankly, I don't think that anyone thinks at this moment that by taking in Turkey and the so-called Western Balkan countries, uh, security and stability in Europe might be increased. Look at the figures from the opinion polls, and we will see that only about 20% of the population of Germany and Austria and France are supporting further enlargement. And if you divide this into countries, and you see that the support for having Turkey in the EU is somewhere around 10 percent or something like this. So, uh, even if we leave for a second this traditional enlargement area like the Western Balkans, if you look at the most recent developments, the Ukrainian crisis, again we'll see that uh, this promised narrative about spreading peace has basically collapsed. Because many people keep on asking that why on earth did the European Union engage in the kind of a zero sum game with Russia and Ukraine? What was the geopolitical uh, idea behind to challenge Russia at that point through offering an agreement that could be interpreted as forcing Ukraine to choose between one of one, uh, one the other? And at least two German chancellors. Social Democratic Chancellors, Schmidt and Schroeder, have actually accused the European Union of committing a great blunder, creating the Ukrainian crisis where there was no reason for it at all. But we might discuss this in long terms, who is responsible and why. If you look at the outcome, the EU did not profit from it. Who profited most from the Ukrainian crisis at this moment? To me, it looks that we had external partners profiting most, the pictures we had from, from France the other day was that, again, Putin and Obama were discussing a European Union. 
without the Europeans, the Ukraine. And we saw Russia going to China to offer itself as a kind of a junior partner <coughs> to the table of energy security. So instead of having a kind of a stability spreading in Europe, at the moment we see huge reminiscences of the, of the Cold War and threats to peace and stability in the future in the region. So I think the first promise about, about internal peace has been highly compromised. The second one about the EU being the motor of improving welfare, well, it worked for a long, long time after the Second World War. We have beautiful uh, memories and we have terms that have become part of our everyday thinking, like Sozialstaat in German and the welfare state in English. But since 2008, since the outbreak of the, debt, the financial debt crisis, for many millions of European Union citizens, we have, they have suffered hardship and some of them have been pushed into outright poverty. And just the other day, the International Labour Organization published a new report called Is Europe Losing Its Soul? One has to say this report was financed by the European Union. And it is about the impact of the crisis on the European social model in times of crisis. And if you look at this report, which is available as, as a PowerPoint presentation on their side, some of the points there are really disturbing that since 2008 there has been a strong increase of poor quality of working conditions, increase in low pay, poverty and inequalities. 40% of the population of the European Union reported difficulties in making ends meet. The working poor, the people who work in the European Union but are poor, is about, on the average, about 10%. So the conclusion of the International Labour Organization is that the pain of the crisis has not been shared equally. There is abundant empirical evidence that in huge parts of the European Union the promise of, letter, of better life has vanished from the everyday experience of people. And the only promise that you can hear now is that the dire times, tough times, will continue for the next five or ten years because no one is really daring to say that the financial crisis, the debt crisis is over and that we will not be confronted with new challenges, especially in Greece, maybe Spain, and even France. And so, on. so, if these two narratives have been compromised, the question is how is the political market <coughs> reacting to this? What are politicians, what are think tankers, what are we offering now as a new narrative? <coughs> Simplifying it really to a great extent, there are now again two new promises that are coming up. One is the old one, my nation first. And the outcome of the European election for the European Parliament illustrates this to a certain extent. Because I think there are now about 90 to 100 members of the European Parliament out of 751 subscribe to this blunt nationalistic thinking and even screaming which means that the rest is still in the mainstream corridor of European thinking. So I wouldn't say that we have seen an explosion of nationalism, but a huge increase. So this is one, one, one response by the political market to try the old game, sort of building a war about the nation and trying to solve your problems by turning to your national, nationalism. The other answer again is more Europe. And this answer more Europe, more European integration is coming both from the traditional center-right and the center-left. And uh, I'll try to illustrate this in just a couple of quotes. Just last week, Wolfgang Schäuble, the German finance minister, arguably one of the most influential and powerful people in Europe at the moment, wrote a huge article in, in the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung about the new seriousness in Europe. This is what he called it, the Neue Ernsthaftigkeit in Europa. And he argued that the way in which Europe handled the financial crisis showed that institutions are cap capable of providing answers. But nevertheless, he said, we have to continue with integration, we have to provide <coughs> a national European <coughs> double democracy, something like those double-decker buses that you see in Skopje, you know, on the one level more national influence, on the other higher level more supranational structures, 
and he was extremely angry at those critics who said that it's not actually the political class, the institutions driving the development, but it's the capital. It's the, the strange and alienated centers of power, Wall Street and the other buzzwords, that are really pushing politics into, into, into actions and that these actions are not freely determined. So Chavez says, no, we are, we are in control of it. We have to improve the way in which democracy in Europe works. Then it will solve the problems of the future. And on the center left, I think that there were two important papers recently. One was in Germany, the Glinike group, a group of economists in Germany who provided a memorandum in which they argued for changes in, in fiscal policy, monetary policy. They argued for more supranational integration in Europe. And this was echoed quite recently in a manifesto for Europe by this uh, rock star economist, uh, Thomas Piketty. I hope I got his name right, the French one, uh, who wrote this uh, Thomas, his famous, one has to say famous books, Capital in the 21st Century, <coughs> both of this, the French and the German group of central left, left intellectuals, argue for some issues that are that were not so popular in the last 20 years. They are arguing for raising corporate taxes, fighting tax havens, spreading income and wealth in society in a more just manner. So if you look into what they are saying, it's definitely not what you could understand and the neoliberal thinking in the last 20 to 30 years in Europe. Common to both Schäuble and the central left is that they are putting up the question of the functioning of democratic institutions that are governing Europe. Remember, there was this Troika hand in the financial crisis, the International Monetary Fund, the European Commission, and the European Central Bank. And a lot of the decisions that they made were only later sort of approved by the European Parliament and the national parliaments. So the issue was again, did the populace, did the population of Europe, the voters, have a chance to have a say about it, or did they just have to say amen to what has happened? So whether this new narrative that we are going to save Europe through better representation in Europe, through a more just economic policy, whether this will catch the imagination of the masses and become as important, as influential as the previous narratives that survived in the last 15 years, this is something that we have to see in the future. And uh, as I said, the average analyst of the German Institute of International Security Affairs does not have a crystal ball and cannot predict the future. But the only thing we can say is that uh, if we were discussing 10 years ago, the future of the European Union, none of us, I think, would say we are at the edge of a crisis, we are at the edge of falling down very fast. Who knows what will be in the 10 years? It, will, it, will, it depends on what used to be called in the, in the socialist times subjectivity factor, the political elite, the political class was going to make the decisions. Thanks. Thank you, uh, thank you, Dushan, for this uh, excellent overview um, and as well for uh, keeping the, the time really really at the uh, check. I, did not, I was not aware of any time. So. <laughs> uh, I was. And that was an excellent. <laughs> yeah, but thank you for putting thank you for putting all these issues at the table. I think uh, I think you provided a, a good overview, <coughs> looking at the sort of the, what what some in Brussels where you currently reside call the democratic deficit. Uh, Vladimir, you from from Vienna, one of the sort of financial centers in, in, in Europe. You, you are uh, in former capital of an empire. Uh, uh, you are uh, observing more the economic the economic trends, both in the east, uh, but also increasingly in the west, as the economy is, is interlinked. Uh, what, what, what are the, the, the key? What is your key reading, and what are the key issues that Europe is now grappling with? This economic slash political conundrum that it, that it currently finds itself. Okay. So good morning. First, and uh, let me just uh, make about four points. And, uh, starting from the economic to maybe the other So first, uh, from uh, shall we say political economy point of view, what are the reasons for the persistence of 
why does the EU actually persist for Basically because it supplies three public goods. Uh, already mentioned two, I'll add the third one. So the first one is security, which is extremely important in the EU, or in Europe in general. And it's mainly about stopping European countries to fight with each other. It's not an external security in, in the sense of uh, security vis-a-vis -vis the, outside, the outside world, but it's really the security vis-a-vis -vis, uh, internal intra-European inter -European national uh, issues. So that's a very powerful uh, reason and very powerful public good that many people in Europe uh, certainly uh, are happy with. So that's one. The other is justice. Uh, the European Union uh, supplies uh, uh, justice in, in, in many forms, including human rights, including uh, uh, rule of law, including uh, spread of democracy, and whatever you connect with the social justice. I also mentioned something about that later on. So that's again extremely important in, uh, in, in, uh, in the minds of, uh, of the EU citizens and also uh, national uh, citizens. EU is a barrier to many of these, uh, shall we say, extreme uh, political forces that have been known, especially in the, in the previous century, to be rather disruptive precisely on this issue of uh, justice uh, on every level. <coughs> Just remember uh, the right wing and the, and the left wing uh, extremism which actually governed the century. So that's the second issue, that second uh, important. And it's really important also in this current political uh, setup and that will come back to that. So that's the yeah. The third one is welfare. European Union has, if you look in the longer term, been one of the rare regions or rare places in, 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 the, in the world and in history that has uh, been able to uh, support convergence between less and more developed uh, countries, even including uh, countries in the transition, look at Poland, look at Czech Republic, Slovakia. We can debate Slovenia for a variety of reasons, uh, also politics, and even uh, even today. But if you look also at the older uh, member states, uh, even the initial six member states and so on, you will see that over time uh, the economic uh, convergence has actually happened. And this is not a very common uh, development uh, historically you know, on the worldwide scale. So there is something to these three public goods, so to speak, that the EU uh, supplies. So that's the first point, or well, why are we at, at all debating this uh, thing? And why is it that it still is out there? And so that's one point. The other point is, what is the main economic issue in this crisis. Essentially, what one sees in this crisis is uh, what are the deficiencies in the setup of the EU, also uh, in the Eurozone. And these are, <coughs> shall we say, procedural and, and substantive. Procedurally, the deficiency is that the EU was supposed to be, in a way, on a self, uh, on self-sustaining process. So once you start with trade integration, then you go to the monetary integration, then you go to the, the democratic elements of democratic legitimacy of this whole process. That sort of self-sustains and leads you to another step, which is eventually some kind of a by a federal uh, system of whatever form it may, uh, may uh, 
take. And this, in this crisis, has been really questioned. We, we don't, we, we do, we seem to, to know what we thought would be working itself out, almost like a self-sustaining process of historical law, but that has been disrupted by this uh, crisis. And where, what else, so now the second aspect was that what would be after Euro introduction especially, what would be mainly on the table is elements of uh, basically fiscal integration. Why? Because you wanted to have eventually uh, a community with, where uh, the insurance of the basic or main risks that individuals face will be in a way European. So uh, when we talk about health, when we talk about education, when we talk about pensions, when we talk about uh, unemployment, you would have some kind of, these are the major risks that you face in a society that, is, that should be sort of somehow insured by a state structure that was supposed to be eventually, in a way, brought up to the European level. It boils down to simplifying to the question of a fiscal union, and that, however, has not been uh, possible to, to debate uh, seriously during this crisis, and probably, though the still on the agenda, it is not really something that is uh, in, the, in the making uh, at this particular moment. Uh, if you don't have that, then the question is, because of this idea of this self-sustaining process which will feel fulfilled, add up all these necessary things once the, the need occurs, you need to think about what of the existing structure you will have to give up if you are not going to have a fiscal union. There is, I, I can discuss that also, there is, seems to be an agreement on the financial, on, on, on the banking union of some sort, which is really completing the, 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 the market agenda, so that's a separate issue. But this is, if that is what you have to give up, this is this whole nationalism versus European issue. What is it else that cannot really be sustained? And one issue is, of course, the euro. And uh, the other issue is connected with the euro, uh, the stabilization function of, of the national state. Because if you are in this kind of type of situation that you are now, there is really no no stabilization in the crisis. You need a stabilization function. That means you need to have some fiscal laxity, uh, primarily, but also some monetary policy laxity. And if you have euro and you have uh, 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 fiscal constraints, you, you are basically losing the stabilization function on the national level, but you are not getting it on the EU level. And that's basically the problem. So either you go in one direction, or you have to give up something in order to, let's say, do something in Greece and so on. And what has been proved, uh, what has surprised many people, uh, strangely enough, I would say, let's say people like Paul Krugman, is that, in fact, most countries don't really want to give up Europe. What has been surprising is why is Greece, to just give an example, why is Greece sticking to this Euro thing? Because it's obviously constraining Greece, it cannot devalue, it has to devalue via cutting wages, cutting employment, and so on. So why is it sticking to it? And that's actually where you see this uh, uh, importance of, of this EU uh, framework, because it is connected with these three uh, issues and three public goods that, that uh, I mentioned. So as soon as you do not want to disintegrate the Eurozone, and as soon as you do not really want to disintegrate the common market, which means free trade, free movement of people, free movement of capital, including now the banking union, 
then you have to go back and say, well, but what do we do with this fiscal issue? Because then these risks have to be somehow addressed.